This is Sean Battle with another edition of the Poetry Talk Show. Next up, presented by Evolu Culture Ventures. Catch these vibes. I am here with someone who is the reason I'm here, Dr. Tara Betts. Tara, Dr. Betts, how are you doing on this wonderful day? I'm doing all right, and it's so good to see you. It's been a long time, but... I do keep tabs on you and I'm just writing and teaching and well, not so much teaching right now. I've been doing more editing work and working on different journals and stuff. So it's good to see you. Same here. And I definitely know, I definitely noticed the work that you've been doing, including um, creating spaces for individuals, especially in Chicago. Um, we are going to get into that, but first, <laughs> Um, I do need to reiterate, poets do not tell, we show out. Dr. Betts, the floor is yours. Okay, so I'll start with a poem then. This is a poem, it's in the anthology, Carving Out Rights from the Prison Industrial Complex, from inside the Prison Industrial Complex. And this poem is called Think, Think. Think about the air invisible, as it uncurls a wave of toxins. Think about how its fingertips trace the skin as a baton falls on the flesh merely seconds later. Think about how heavy metals brown the water and we are told to drink. Think about how many of us wonder when the roofs over our heads will be tongues evicted from the languages of home. Think about how every person needs a doctor, but everyone doesn't get one. Think about how savings mean nothing to the crazy fine print circumscribed like obsolete glyphs. Think about how law books open and hopscotch for anyone who keeps writing checks. Think, think, think like Aretha Franklin belting what you trying to do to me. Think how the law keeps shuffling the numbers to fit some constant where acknowledging who is human is posited in some philosophy or some mathematical equation that pretends that logic is its function. When blood needs to find something superior, something that denies how human is defined by a much wider net cast by some divine fisherman, or perhaps an African goddess in a gown laced with sea foam. But place markers for faith are constantly moved towards a crucifix. A human can find more than one path, I hope. Think about how every day someone is hoping for some simple thing like fresh bread lightly toasted, the ability to walk without pain, a chance to shower, a moment free of fist and jeer, a moment singing victorious as if we could level the wrongs and leave the world upright. Like a gospel drenched woman, singing freedom, freedom after forgiveness, after you change your mind, because you need to think and act to be free. Ooh, thank you so much. Thank you so much. Um, as I was, I had, the, I had the, the, the words in front of me as well as hearing you and especially when you got to think, 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 I kept hearing clink, 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 especially as you were speaking about, um, you know, the current state of the prison industrial complex um, and this new notion to be free. My mind also went to what's been going on with the pandemic recently, especially when it comes to those who have been incarcerated um, and just dealing with that right now. And when in their own rights being fringed upon just for the basic basic human needs because they're still humans at the end of the day. Um, I know, uh, Dr. Betts, that you uh, have taught workshops um, in various prisons. So how much of that experience has affected your writing in terms of how you just are able to view and reflect on humanity in the current state? Well, for me, I think... It's been, I don't know how much it's affected my writing. It's definitely impacted my spirit in a lot of ways. Like I think about 
gratitude in very different ways that I didn't think about it before. Like all the things that we take for granted as free people, right? You know, the amount of space that we can come and go as we please, that we can wear what we want, we can eat what we want. We probably have better access to healthcare and water, even if you're uninsured, you know? And it's, it makes you feel very conflicted and you have all these feelings, especially if you're a person of African-American descent, right? Like I walk into a prison or even a jail or a, a smaller correctional facility and it's almost always predominantly black. And I just, I, I can't help myself but to think about the calculations of what if some of these people were home? What if most of them were home? What if they had never been convicted? What if there were social services that helped a lot of people with mental health, domestic violence, jobs, all of that. Like you have that running dialectic in your head the whole time when you're there, but you have to be present in so many ways, right? So, cause they do, they lock you in the facility <laughs> and you're constantly being monitored. So it's a different kind of experience to teach in that environment, but it's also very rewarding, you know? I've, I've had students who have written poems that really inspired me. And I've had students who ask really great questions and read the books and don't fight me on reading the books. <laughs> Which unfortunately, you know, some college students have a hard time with that. But, you know, I also feel like maybe it's a maturity thing too. A lot of people who have been at Stateville have been there for a long time and they're adults, right? Like they, they're, some of them are older than me. So I think some of them are in a different kind of headspace too, as more mature people. Yeah, I definitely agree with that. I definitely agree with that. Um, just having some people in my family who have gone through that, gone through that uh, experience and just growing up with them surrounding me as well and giving me warnings, uh, which is why they pushed me towards school and things of that nature. Right. And that brought us, uh, that's brought you and I together actually at a very timely, in a very timely way, because mm -hmm. you're one of the few poets, one of the few teachers who get it in terms of what I was doing with my writing. Right. Um, especially in terms of just spoken word and things of that nature, but also pushing me, get your ass to be a better writer before you even think about the stage. Um, so you and I had that history back at Rutgers. What was, and it doesn't have to be from anybody from any of my classes, but what, what examples do you have of um, people trying to push back on the curriculum that you were presenting and how do you respond to that? In that, in, that, in that setting? Well, I wouldn't call it pushback, right? Like, I think a lot of students, particularly if you have first year or second year undergrads, they're very used to how they learn stuff in high school. There's definitely a marked difference if you have first year students as opposed to students who are junior or senior year because they've figured out, you know, it's a little bit more rigorous than high school. So they're not gonna do the same things and they, they realize you're pushing them to do something deeper than the five paragraph essay or that you want them to be more descriptive or you want them to really flesh out something that's not like a bag of Doritos. You want them to actually make a meal so there's that, right? And I think about that a lot in terms of, you know, that phase of college. But then also, it's like, you're also starting to question the values that you were brought up with. You're starting to question what your parents taught you. You may be thinking about how you identify in the world. 
So it's a really difficult time, I think, for a lot of college students when they first come to college. It definitely was for me. Um, so if you're you're having some of those ideas challenged, whether it's about race, gender, or how you're going to make a living, like there's so many different ways to approach it, right? So when you think about it that way, it's just, you know, a really challenging time. And I think it's challenging for teachers if you don't keep that in mind, right? Because you just thinking you're just there to deliver content. And I'm like, nope, you're not just there to read them poems. You're there to kind of acclimate them to this way of thinking about learning. Definitely. And part of that for you, or what I've gotten out of it, has been an emphasis on clarity. One of the uh, one of the big pieces of text that you introduced to me through your curriculum was the spoke was the anthology, the spoken word revolution. And it was there that I was introduced to Jack McCarthy, because this poem, Be Careful What You Wish For, was in there. Um, and to me, it it was one of the first few times that it kind of clicked for me, or what poetry could be. It could be storytelling, it could be a narrative, but there's an underlining um, image that is being built up throughout that time. Um, what examples of clarity? It could be an individual poem, it could be poets that you would recommend um, in terms of clarity, but at the same time, they're still giving you those visuals or they're still giving you that sequence of language that gives you that experience. What examples would you give to any student who needs to be taught? You need to be as clear as possible what you're saying. Examples of clarity. Well, I mean, most of the poets that I really enjoy do that. I think good fiction writers do that, you know, or I think about, what is it? I always think about Mari Evans' essay. She was a Black arts movement poet, and she has a book of essays called Clarity as Concept. And she's basically talking about this idea that if you are clear, as clear as possible, it's irrefutable mm. as to what point you're making. Like, that's what you want the work to do, right? And I think when I think of clarity, I think of that. I think about what does it mean in terms of being an editor, right? Like how easy it is to have like a small grammatical faux pas or something of that nature. And you don't want that to happen. So when you go into that linguistic obscurity that some poets do, where you have no idea what they're talking about, I don't find that appealing. Like I, I'm, I'm very into a poem that makes me do some work because I just read a lot. So yeah, every once in a while I enjoy a poem that makes me work a little bit or it's a little bit like a puzzle, but it should be able to be clear enough so I can figure it out and follow the breadcrumbs to where you want me to go, right? So even that's a sort of clarity too. Yeah, you gotta give the reader something to kind of help them weave through, help them weave through the thread of what exactly is going on or what, what you're trying to stick the landing um, one of the poems that I think about is from your first book, Arc and Hue, uh, for those who need a true story, yeah. aka the poem. Um, and you give people, <laughs> and, for those, and if you heard the poem, you'll know what I'm talking about for those who are watching, but you give people that thread of, okay, this is the narrative of where it is going. And then right at the end, you... Right at the end, everything comes together, but not in a way that is spoon feeding, but you're just giving us that aha moment, especially for those who did need to hear that uh, in terms of writing those type of stories, writing those type of narratives, make sure that you got some meat behind it um, before you share anything like that, because these narratives are these narratives, these stories are real ass people behind behind them. Um, and of course, we talk about the speaker of the poet not being the speaker of the poem, like separating the two. Um, what are some times where you read a piece where it's obvious in the wrong way um, that those things are separate, but the speaker of the poet, the writer is not honoring the speaker of the poem as well, I'll put it. Hmm. 
I mean, that's a tough question because I feel like I'm so used to trying to be either I am the speaker and I'll be clear about that or I found a way somehow in my head to turn on the camera and make it like I'm watching the movie unfold, right? Mm. And even if it's just me focusing on an image, I see it and I just, I'm trying to describe it like I'm kind of detached from it sometimes. And I don't think detachment is good all the time, right? Like sometimes it should be your voice. Mm. You know, like when I think about that poem, that poem is not written in the first person, right? As an example, but I do remember the person who I call Raymond in the poem telling me that story, right? But the extrapolation that comes at the end, when I start talking about people who should find soft lives that drop pendulums in their dreams, like that's kind of my voice at the end tacking on, it's like, I imagined the scene from what he told me and gave it new language, but it's like that whole part at the end is me reflecting on why that story stayed with me. Why was that story so powerful, right? And I think we kind of do that. We weave those voices together to create like something that's a whole cloth in the end. That's actually refreshing to hear. And I say that because so many times, and this is me dealing with other teachers around the same time I had you or even in grad school, um, you have uh, many people saying, no, always say the speaker of the poem, like always keeping things separate. And while I understand that, there are some times where it's like, no, own your shit. This is you. This, this is you. Because I, I kind of feel also people use that to separate themselves from the piece and thus separate accountability um, at times where the poem doesn't land. So it's definitely refreshing to hear that. And also the whole thing about sentimentality and blah, 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 which sometimes you definitely need, um, I feel, especially as an artist of color. Um, yeah, and I do think, I mean, as far as talking about a speaker, like if you're looking at work on the page, that totally makes sense because you don't always want to assume the person who wrote it is the person talk. Like it could be a poem where they write in the voice of another person, mm -hmm. right? So I, I do tend to use that as well for that reason. I don't want to make the assumption. But it's funny because I had this conversation with Tayamba just recently. And we were talking about how he when he was writing Olio, he didn't realize that there were all these things that he thought said something about how he lives in the world until he went back and started reading the book again. And he was like, oh, it's talking. Like, and I think all writers do that. Like, even if you're writing about, I don't know, humpback whales or starfish or the sun today, whatever random subject you choose, it's like, somehow you chose that because it speaks to something that's turning and rumbling inside you. And the moment you say that, I keep thinking about a form. I'm trying to remember if you introduced it to me or you just introduced the writer who created it and I just found it on myself. I'm talking about a Fa Michael Weaver who created the bop, who founded the, the bop. Um, yeah, I think that was in one of your classes that I, yeah, I remember teaching that with you guys. And for those who don't know, a bop, um, first of all, it comes from the same name from a, uh, uh, Baltimore, Baltimore slang that describes a man's walk. That's the definition I've seen. Uh, yeah. So the bop speaks on what it means for, thus the bop speaks for what it means for a poet to be. Um, first stanza, six lines, then the refrain, then the first stanza presents the problem. Second stanza, and I'm, and I'm giving the example because it's National Poetry Month. Um, second stanza, eight lines, expands upon the problem, then the refrain. Third, uh, third stanza, six lines, Either the problem is solved or the problem is expanded upon in terms of why it hasn't been solved. And then the refrain. The refrain usually comes from a song lyric of things of that nature. Um, unless you have an original phrase or 
your turning a phrase that you've heard before. A little salt don't hurt nobody, to give an example. Um, and so I think of that, I think of forms like that who really em put an emphasis on being, who put an emphasis on voice, who put an emphasis on the speaker. Um, and for you, and I also wanted to speak on uh, just this idea of, I guess, self, just idea of self-reflection. Um, when it is this, when the speaker is you, um, when do you know to like straight out say what the thing is? And when do you know as a writer to give that thing an image so that it sticks to the reader? Sometimes I just think about what's the image that sticks with me? What's the thing that won't leave, right? Or this is gonna sound kind of psychedelic. I feel like sometimes um, if I have an idea, it kind of, it's almost like, have you ever seen like speed lapse photography of a flower opening? I feel like I see that in my head and it opens up. Whatever that idea is, it starts to materialize out of a black screen in my head and I see it. And so I know when I see that screen, it's like, okay, you better, where's the paper <laughs> you know and so I don't get that all the time but I've gotten it enough to know okay sometimes writing is about rigor more than you just imagining and being inspired and I've taught you guys that you know like you aren't you aren't inspired every day but you can feed inspiration right like you can be an observer of your world you can be somebody who reads a lot, you can watch movies, you can, you know, look at art, you can live life, you know, and those things can feed that where it, it, it comes up a little bit more frequently. And I think that's all you can do is just replenish the well and keep writing. When I hear that, I'm thinking poetry at times is people, place or thing watching, and knowing when to slow it down, when to let it unfold, when to let it unfold. Um, or at least when you, when something really sticks here, all right, go with it, you know? Cause it's easy. I guess I'm just thinking, and I'm sorry, I cut you off. I'm just thinking about how I see so many poetry books now and it's clear that people have grind, right? Like they go through the exercises and maybe the poems all have the same title or they decide to do a book of sonnets. Like there's obviously a constraint that they were working with to make a coherent collection where everything links up. But I also feel like you gotta have room for the inspiration to come in in some different ways. Otherwise it gets kind of tedious, at least to me. I wonder if that's more so from people's first book as opposed to their, you know, second or third, et cetera. Um, I only say that because I know with The Forest of Bricks, my first book, that was my MFA thesis that had time to breathe after a year because I needed to, I like to say, defame the MFA out of my work because sometimes we workshop everything so much. It's like, wait a minute, where the hell is the heart? Where the hell is the blood? And you almost got to add that back. Mm -hmm. um, with you getting a PhD in Binghamton University for creative writing, have you found yourself within your writing having to do something similar, like almost defame the academia out of your work or however you want to say it, but you felt like something, a spirit had to be, go back and add it in terms of editing without the lens of the classroom? I don't think that I'm really, this is the fortunate thing, right, is that I had the opportunity to be a university professor with you guys at Rutgers before I went to the PhD, you know, and I was an older student. So I was, you know, I had published, I had published a book before I went there. So I had a certain level of confidence, but I was also humble. Like I want to come and learn. Um, but you couldn't just tell me anything, right? And thankfully, I had really good faculty uh, that challenged me. I had really supportive people like Joe Weil and Maria Gillen who wanted to see me 
win. They wanted to see me finish and get my work out into the world. You know, I think about Jenny Stover who teaches sound studies in the English department, but she also pushed me to be a stronger critical writer. So for me, I think I got to flesh out and become more confident in writing prose, but I wrote Black, I wrote Break the Habit in its entirety up there. And I wouldn't have been able to do that without their support, you know? Um, I feel like they gave me a lot of freedom because they knew I was, you know, they're like, like they even told me a couple times, they're like, Tara, you're already a professor. <laughs> you know, we know you got this, you know, and then it would be like they give me suggestions here and there, but it really just was an opportunity for me to learn more deeply, to be able to, you know, live in the library and pour through stuff on JSTOR and, you know, write other stuff. Cause I wrote a libretto about Muhammad Ali while I was there. I wrote some short stories. I wrote essays, you know, I just didn't have to, you know, it was like being in a little cubby hole away from the rest of the world. Definitely understand that. It makes me miss the, makes me miss a little bit the space I had um, regarding that in my MFA times as well, and even in my undergrad. Um, we're going to definitely get into space for letting the writer be, um, which is definitely important. To quickly reset, this is Next up, the Poetry Talk Show presented by Evolu Culture Ventures. I am Sean Battle, and I am here with Dr. Tara Betts, uh, a legend out in these poetry streets, as far as I'm concerned. Um, so it's great to have you here. Dr. Betts, if you would like to share your second poem, and then we're going to definitely get into you about space for poets to just be. Okay. Um, I'm going to read the opening poem in Break the Habit. And that one is a lesson from the Terror Dome. And I'll just start with that. Echoes of sirens blared while phrases belted from the boom of Chuck D's voice left imprints sinking into memory that bobs up when buoyant history is necessary. The blast and thump of welcome to the Terror Dome droned intent with Flavor Flav's clock swinging on his neck a manic shiny searchlight beaming from a black planet that still embodies fear and chaos for some. When the dancers marched and pivoted in lockstep military formation in front of a target with crosshairs imposed on a black man's silhouette, Chuck D insisted to everyone in earshot, come on down. The sample's rapid response, get down, fired back, but the internal rhyme and the shooting of Huey Newton never left my head. It sent me curious to a small Midwestern library before internet searches streamed into houses. So my finger traced columns in an antiquated guide to periodicals, flipped through a card catalog's long shelves, looked for the ends, then Newton, who was he? When I clicked the microfiche onto spindle and rolled through the articles moving across a white screen, squares of photos and text rolled one frame at a time until the brief article appeared. Black Panther found dead in Oakland. I shook my head and silently asked how much of the story is missing, how I wouldn't even know about the bullet dropping Newton if Chuck hadn't told me. Mm. That last line was it. Because as I'm listening, I'm thinking about how uh, art form like hip hop, which many people got so much shit to say, um, but it ends up being, and not a lot of times they look, it's not people who look like us, but it's, and, but you hear something like that. You hear a reference like that from us, from uh, groups like Public Enemy, and you just end up, wait a minute, what's going on here? And you end up doing that research because you were inspired by uh, a song that you heard, because you were inspired right. by a book that you read. Inspiration can come any fucking where, and it leads you to do a deep dive into your own 
history and your own under your own understanding. Um, how big of an influence does hip hop play in your poetry and just in your uh, collective collective thought? I would say for me, it's not just hip hop anymore. I feel like, you know, we're kind of past the phase of what Chuck D said about hip hop being the CNN of Black America. I don't think it's the CNN of Black America at this point um, because it's so commercialized, right? And because of that commercialization, it doesn't have the same voice that it once had. And so I don't blame the artists for that. I blame the people who demand a certain kind of commodification of it. However, <laughs> I do think no matter what the genre is, I find a lot of inspiration from whatever music moves me. And I think that's what artists should do, right? Go with the thing that moves you. Like when I was looking at Break the Habit with some folks, you know, people were like, you referencing Public Enemy, The Cure, Hector Lavoe, um, who else? But it was like a really, you know, all over the place kind of mixture of music. But I'm like, that's what I was feeling when I was writing it. That's what I was... You know, and not just that, but I might be like, yeah, I'm going to listen to Ka, who's from Brownsville. I'm going to listen to, you know, like that's, you get, you know, where your head is at. And honestly, and that works with the, with the title of the collection, because when you break the habit, you're breaking assumptions. You're breaking patterns that had already been uh, presented and even assumed. And with that, the more diverse your palette, the more uh inspiration that you can get and i definitely know that from know that from you just from know, knowing your work um and it pushes honestly it pushes me to like okay if you're getting references from this from wrestling or things of that nature push yourself to have that blend push that self to have that blend well like you end up being that example um and what you said about you know how hip-hop has changed and how music has changed as a whole kind of why I end up going, you know, the route of listening to more independent or local artists even because you'll find more of that spirit. Uh, hopefully you find more of that, more of that spirit um, in terms of things not being so commod commodified. Uh, and sometimes, and sometimes I wonder, I end up thinking back to how much, how many people want poetry to blow up or how we yeah. want it to be in a bigger hemisphere you know we had brandon link when america's got talent we have amanda gorman out in these streets after the inauguration right. and i almost wondered is that even number one is that even possible with the medium number two do we even want that like it's one of those things where it's like be careful what you ask for i feel like i mean they're gonna let it happen right that's where i feel like we're at we've had these little convulsions where you know, whether it's poets having television shows now or poets doing radio, poets doing movies, like that's not a new thing now. Um, but we're definitely in a phase where we should be questioning why those poems are being put on that stage. And that's not to say they're bad poems or they're good poems, that's just to say, why, you know, is it a good thing? Like, are they making the public critically interrogate things more or are they just doing it because it's a really good optic, you know, to seem like you're intellectually engaged or like you care about poetry or <laughs> are they picking people who don't do scary work? I think there's that too, right? Like I said, you know, I'm very happy for Amanda Gorman. I think she's, she represents a lot of different things to a lot of different people, right? But I also feel like I want to see what she writes 10 years from now. I also want to see what she writes when she's not vetted by a corporate entity by the, like the NFL or the government. Because before any inaugural poet gets on stage, they vet their poem. 
right? So whatever we're judging has gone through some stuff before we even got to experience it. It's not like when a lot of poets write their poem and if it gets vetted, it gets vetted in a workshop or it gets vetted at an open mic. You know, that's a different kind of vetting. It's not the same. Definitely, I definitely agree with that. And it reminds me that certain conversations, certain kitchen table talk, um, it's almost like we gotta be careful of, I personally have to be careful where to have that and who to have that with because I find myself, uh-uh, don't you slander that girl on my on a, on a public forum and have me find out because that's coming with a whole other baggage and it's going to be a whole bunch of issues if you come at her wrong. So it's like... Right. And I also feel like, too, it's like, are you slandering her because you really don't like the poems or you don't like what she represents? And that's why I said what I said because I'm like, I have questions, right? That's just like, there was talk. I don't want to, you know, banter around names, but there was somebody on the internet who was talking about somebody's work. They were basically subtweeting. And you knew they, apparently other people knew they were talking about somebody. And I said, who does that, right? Like I just responded to the tweet, like who does that particular thing? And then somebody tweeted me back and they were like, oh, they're talking about person C because they're homophobic and blah, blah, blah. I said, wait, person C can write. <laughs> like when I heard the person's name, I'm like, why? Like I had question mark, like how did you say that that writer does that when I know they don't do that, you know? So you have to ask yourself, what is that kind of subcutaneous layer of loathing and fat <laughs> that makes them say something ugly about people. It's the same thing like when you're in a writing workshop. Some people really want to help you. And some people have no idea what the hell they're talking about or what kind of baggage they brought into talking about your work. So you may have to take it with a grain of salt, right? Like, no. <laughs> Hold up, we gonna do this right here. Right, oh, you need to sip the water behind that comment. Okay, I'll sip as well. <clears throat> that wasn't even my thought was really into scratching. Like, that was, yeah, but but at the same time, I didn't have the tea. I would have just you're right. <laughs> but at the, but at the same time, I've I've had that type of conversation multiple times and. It's one of those things where I gotta be like, great, almost where I gotta be like, I gotta separate it. Great writers suck a human being. And especially as a curator, honestly, where, cause certain people, I don't care how talented you are, you're not on my show for a multitude of reasons, but you have to separate that. So to really have um, the best kind, of con best kind of conversations and also know where exactly people are coming from when they do give critique as a whole. I've had to deal with that with my MFA program. It's kind of why I'm kind of PTSD out this bitch. But at the same time, um, again, people really do want to help you and you got to do that mental work of separate of separating the two. Um, as you were writing Break the Habit, because that came at a time where a lot of things were changing in your life as well. I'm not going to get into that. Um, have you had to do that, like do those type of mental mental leaps as well um, especially with such, especially with certain, with certain subject matter. And if so, how were you able to get through it, especially doing a PhD program? Well, like I said, I think, again, the people that I worked with really believed in me and wanted to affirm that I just needed to write. Like, Tari, you just need the space to write, just write. And I, I really love that Maria encourages that with all of her students, right? Um, but for me, I feel like if you wanna be a good writer, you have to step into that fearlessness. And I really love writers who do that. Like Sharon Olds was one of those people for me. Toy Derricott, Afa Weaver, you know, people who talk about these really difficult things and, and find ways to make it artful, to make it moving. Because you could say something horrible happened to you, 
but to make it artful is really difficult right and I've, I've been trying to do that or it's like you know so I'm, I'm not gonna go into detail detail about the whole book but would break the habit, you know, it was about my divorce. And I started thinking about not just were the moments that made me horribly sad and I knew things were closing, but what were the moments that made me love this person, right? Because we forget that, right? Like you think, I think a lot of people think when you have a breakup or you have a divorce, you just be like, I hate this person. I hate everything they stand for. And you start sounding like Dave Chappelle. <laughs> But <laughs> if you're old enough to remember Dave Chappelle, I feel like some people are like, what is that? But it's on Netflix, y'all figure it out. Um, if you wanna go there, cause I know some people don't like him now, but it's, um, you, you were there for a reason, right? Like you liked them at one point, you maybe loved them at one point. You know, there was something likable that made you accommodate them in your space and time. <laughs>